Today I'm here right outside of Times Square in New York City. Sales, I think, is, is something that a lot of agencies don't do well because we expect the marketing to do the work. I'm speaking for Digital Marketers Conference, Digital Agency Expo, and my goal up there was to help hundreds of agency owners from all over the world learn how to build more successful and profitable agencies. What I did right was I created something different. What I did wrong was I created something very easy to duplicate. The great thing is I learned that everything I spoke about is applicable for any business, including fitness studios. You're telling me at, you just made your entire decision off of one word? So sit back and relax as I share with you how I've been able to build this business to an eight-figure business and build an incredible team around me that's able to support the company and grow even when I'm not in the office. That's the difference between a million and a billion. And let's give Mike Arce a massive digital agency expo welcome. Hello everyone. My, my company, Loud Rumor, is the agency uh, that we actually run that helps fitness studios all over the world um, really grow and scale their businesses. And Loud Rumor now, uh, in two months, will be celebrating its 10 year anniversary. Is that pretty cool? <laughs> Where we stand right now, Loud Rumor is doing just over a million dollars in monthly recurring revenue. Um, and a big part of that has happened over the last like year or so where we've been adding $40,000 in monthly recurring revenue every single month. And that's net, meaning even when, you know, we have the natural attrition that any agency has, we're still able to meet our goals and exceed our goals every single month. So um, a big part of that um, has come from not one change. It's come from many changes, some small, meaning very easy to implement, some big, meaning it took months to actually be able to do it the right way. Um, and I can't tell you which one of them was more impactful than the others, because I, I don't know, but I know that the combination of all those things really helped create a business that was not only uh, much more effective, but much more enjoyable. I think the, the best part about the, the company that I get to lead today is that I'm not working like I used to. I used to be nonstop waking up 4 a.m., 5 a.m. every morning, just immediately getting the emails, immediately getting the tickets and all the stuff I had to do and managing people and managing um, you know, outsourcers and everything I could possibly do until 11, 12, one o'clock in the morning. Didn't really matter, I was just up all the time working. And today, I would say I don't do any real work when it comes to that kind of stuff anymore. The majority of my work is revolved around what I've learned from different people, mentors, is being just a real great CEO and finding what the next opportunity is for our agency, who the people I should be meeting and connecting with, and how we could be expanding, not just by you know, a client or two, but by 100 clients or two just in the next month or two. Does that make sense? So a lot of what we're gonna be sharing is how we've gotten to this point. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Okay, so let's start off with all the things that I believe uh, has really helped us out. And some of the things I'm gonna be sharing here, um, you may be actually testing yourself and wondering if it's ever gonna work. Some things you may have thought about testing and haven't yet because you're afraid that it may not work. And maybe there's some things that we'll talk about today that you haven't even considered or thought of, and that's pretty cool because maybe you guys will give it a shot too and hopefully it works for you as well as it worked for me. And there's about like 10, 12 things. Are you guys okay? I'll list them all out, yes? So we'll start with the first one, and they're in no particular order. I'm just gonna go in the order. I felt like it flowed the best for you guys to get all the information and see it all come together. So up until 2015, um, our company was really just not getting anywhere. It felt like you know, we were just doing the same year over and over and over. In fact, the last three years, we were basically between that 30 and $40,000 mark in monthly recurring revenue every single year. And um, I remember our peak was 42,000. That was like a, the highest we were able to get up to up until 2015. And just when we thought we would pass it, we would lose a client or a couple clients and we're like, here we go again. We're just back, we're just back again. And it was very frustrating. Anybody relate to that at all? Yeah? Stressful, it's very frustrating because you know how hard you're working, you feel like you're doing all the right things, but yet the right things aren't happening. How is that possible? You're doing the right things and the right thing isn't happening. Um, well, sometimes you're doing the right things the wrong way or sometimes you're doing the right things at the wrong time. So we're gonna talk about that too. All right, up until 2015, we were stuck. And so I read this really great book uh, right around summer leading into the fall called Built to Sell. How many of you guys read the book Built to Sell before? Raise your hands if you like the book Built to Sell. It's a great book. And really the, the biggest takeaway from the book is, you know, don't be a generalist 
be somebody that can really master something and get really great so that you can charge a lot more and you can actually be sought after rather than you bidding on projects. How many of you guys hate competing with another person on a proposal or anything like that? Yeah, we don't do that anymore, it's over. So we read that, now the way they did it, they niched into the service. I think they went from like everything to logos and that's all they did in the book. Um, we niched into industry. When I first read the book, I did it wrong. I did the right thing wrong. So I niched and I chose dentistry as the niche. The reason I chose dentistry as a niche is because out of the 30 some clients that we had, 11 of them were dentists. So it just seemed like the path to least resistance. How many of you guys would say you'd probably choose dentistry too if that were the case, right? It just made sense. And there was no reason why we weren't targeting them more. We just got dentists. And so I think sometimes I've seen it with a lot of agencies that we talk to. Sometimes they just pick one that seems like it makes sense. And the problem with dentists, because it didn't really work well, is that I actually hate the dentist. I hate it. In fact, I go to the dentist every three months because when I go there, I want them to have nothing to do. And that's why I go more so there's less work. And the idea of having to learn more about the dentist industry and go to conferences like this, but for dentists, and listen to influencers in the dental world and read blogs and do all that stuff, no pun intended, you'd have, it's like pulling teeth to get me to do it. Right? So I was like, man, this sucks. This niche thing does not work. And so I stopped. And then towards the end of 2015, I got an ad served up to me on Facebook. And it was this guy talking about how he can blow it up for you with Facebook ads. He can help your clients dramatically with Facebook ads. And he had proof and I was like, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. So we bought his course, like a thousand bucks, got him signed, got him with my team. My team started executing it and it actually worked really, really well. And we started getting results. So I went to go reach out to the guy. And since then, we've actually become really good friends. Um, some of you guys probably know him because he's contributed. His name's Billy Jean. How, raise your hand if you guys know Billy. Billy Jean? Yep. Billy Jean is Mark, one person. Uh, Billy Jean's cool. I'll give him a round of applause because he actually helped me quite a bit. So, Billy and I have actually become really good friends. We, we talk probably every day or almost every day. And I think the friendship where it really came from was where, when I first met Billy, I was having a hard time with ads, and particularly Facebook, and he was having a hard time with dad life. He was about to have a kid, he was starting a business, and we actually were able to kind of like mentor each other, because at the time, I, I had the same journey, but I was already three kids in, and I had that column pretty well done. And so I was able to help Billy with one thing, he was able to help me, and because of that, we developed a really great friendship together. But he, he asked me, he's like, how come you're not niching? How come you're helping everybody? And how come you're doing everything? We did everything. And, he, and I said, I've niched, it didn't work. And he asked me about it and he said, dude, that's not how you pick a niche. You gotta pick something that you actually enjoy learning about. What do you do for fun? What do you like to do for, like, I like Xbox, what do you like? And I said, I like fitness. I was like, that's my thing. I work out five, six days a week. I was in the fitness industry for seven years prior to that. I was a personal trainer, started my own personal training company. I ran and managed several different clubs in the industry. I go, I was really good at that. He's like, dude, that's it. That's the easiest thing in the world. Just help fitness studios and gyms. And I was like, okay. Sounds good. I just did it. Because honestly, at that point, you ever get to the point where like nothing's working, you're like, oh, dude, I'll give anything a shot. I don't care. <laughs> I was at that point. I was like not refusing any advice. And so I niched. The crazy thing is, we were only at 40 clients. Within 18 months, we had over four, 400 fitness studios now working with us as clients. Is that pretty cool? 18 months. Now there's a lot of stuff that happened. It wasn't just the niche. So I don't want you guys to think, okay, cool. We niche, we pick something. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and do all this stuff. No, see what happened with that is all the other things I'm gonna talk about was a lot easier for me to start executing at, at the right level. So I had to create content. And, and see, when you love the, the thing that you're learning about, you learn it better. And the better you learn it, the better you can teach it. And so for me, I was starting to create a lot of content around it as I was digesting a ton of it. And so first we started creating random videos. Videos, even as simple as how to create content for your fitness studio. And we would give suggestions in there and we'd have like little graphics, but it would be like, guys, you're, and how many of you guys have clients you wish created more content for themselves? Okay, so here's one that I usually say to them and it works every time. Because the big, you know why they don't create the content? You know why? Well, sometimes it's camera fright. Sometimes they don't know what to say, but a lot of it stems from they want to be like super innovative and they don't know what to say that actually is new and fresh. And I, I don't think I ever had that problem. I didn't care about 
coming up with things that nobody's ever heard about. And, and because I think when you do that, you're really looking to impress your peers, like other agencies at your level or higher. I cared about helping the people that would actually hire me, fitness studio owners, right? So I created content for them, and a lot of the stuff wasn't that innovative, it was just they needed to hear it. Now, when my clients were saying, man, I don't know what to create, and I said, there's tons of stuff. What do your clients ask you every day, right? Um, what should I eat before a workout? What should I eat after a workout? Can I eat before bed? If so, what? What should I have for breakfast? What's the difference between good carbs and bad carbs? Good proteins, bad proteins? You know, what, what kind of supplements should I take? Should I stress? I mean, guys, endless, right? Yes. You get asked all those questions? Yes, I do. Okay, well then create content around that. Yeah, but everyone's doing it. Yeah, but if, if it's already out there, then why are they still asking you the questions? The reason they're still asking the questions is because that world is different than theirs. See, algorithms create, us, create different realities for us. When you go on Facebook and I go on Facebook, we have a different world. So for me, I get served up just like you guys. We, raise your hand if you get served up a lot of agency stuff and marketing stuff and ad stuff and whatever your niche is. Well, my sister doesn't. My sister is not into marketing or sales or advertising. She probably gets served up stuff around teaching because that's what she does. Right? So you got to understand that their world is different. Do you ever hear Tony Robbins talk about the reticular activating system? Yes or no? Yes? So basically the idea is whatever you focus on is going to be there, right? Um, you find what you're looking for is, is a quote that we say a lot in our office. And so if you buy a car, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere and it seems like it's there way more than it was before. Well, same thing goes. For us, me, in my industry, I notice everything marketing related, fitness related, all that stuff. I notice everything. It doesn't pass me. I used to do door-to-door -door sales for an alarm company when I was 19. Still to this day, I notice alarm signs in front of everyone's houses and I know what company they're working with. I can't even change my mind around it. So your member, or your, what I told fitness studios, your clients, they don't even, they aren't even paying attention to your stuff because that's not even something they're worried about. But if there's a pain there, then they'll pay attention. So you gotta start creating content for them and serving it up and then what you'll notice is with that and your retargeting list, it'll actually be able to drive in a lot more and you take them down a funnel. So for us, we started creating a ton of content. And that was a problem. We did that, that was the right thing. We also did that wrong. So when we started creating content, we were like, okay, it's all about quantity. Quantity is more important than quality. And then what we realized was, okay, quality is important. And then we started getting into really good stuff content-wise but it still wasn't working. What happened was we actually created what I believe, I've never seen it before us, and I remember creating it in the marketing meeting, the idea of the testimonial meme. What that means is it's the meme of the testimonial video, me interviewing the client of mine, and then in the meme format, it would have like the results they achieved, 62 members in two weeks, and then a bunch of stuff on the bottom. So that was our idea. We were so excited about it because it wasn't being done. And then in one week, I noticed somebody else doing it. And then in like three months, like 10 people did it. And then in like a year, everyone's doing it. And now everyone's got this testimonial meme format. The problem was the thing I created, what I did right was I created something different. What I did wrong was I created something very easy to duplicate. It was just too easy. It was too lazy. And because it was too easy to, to duplicate, somebody with $5 in a Fiverr account can do it. It's that simple. <clears throat> so we had to level our game up. So when you look at our content, if you guys ever get a chance to go to the GSD show and watch our, our podcast we created, if you look back at episode one, it looks like virtually every podcast. Too easy. Everyone started creating a podcast. When you look now, it's like a sports center theme. Anybody ever see my podcast, like the GOAT show or the GSD show? Okay, we got some hands, good. So have you guys noticed like a sports center theme and we have other episodes where it's like animation, there's music, there's graphics, there's sound effects, there's all this stuff and transitions and we got incredible people on the show and that, would you agree, is much difficult to duplicate? And so what happens is you have a lot of people that don't even give it a shot. They're like, you know what? I'm not even doing that. Or they'll justify and say, dude, you don't need to do all that. All you need is this. I even hear influencers say, I even hear them say, the best videos, the best ones, you just take out your phone and talk to it. That is not true. That is lazy, but it's easier to sell their thing, right? Because anyone can do it. So that means anyone can buy this product and learn the system. But now don't get me wrong, I have videos randomly like Instagram stories where I will talk to my phone every once in a while, but that's not what's catapulting our growth. What's really setting us apart is the stuff that sets us apart. 
So when you look at the show, no one's come close. Still, we've, launched, we've run it like for two years, the way it looks today, and just getting better and better. No one's even created anything close to how it was when we first started doing it that way. You do the same thing with our conference. See, you guys have this. Marketing, advertising, sales, we're spoiled. We have really cool looking conferences, right? There's like lights and shows, there's cameras, like the screens like this and all this, there's all these monitors, everything's really great. In the fitness studio space, disgusting. It's a, it's a room, like daylight lit up room in the Marriott where everyone sits down in these weird looking chairs and then you get like a pad that came with the Marriott and a pen that came with the Marriott and then you get like tea or water and then that's it. There's nothing else going on. And when you get introduced, it's terrible. They bring you up in front of everyone, everyone's waiting. So imagine if Marcus, in front of you guys, by the way, no stage, I'm at floor level, that's how it would be. Marcus would bring me up and go, all right guys, so here, Mike, just set up your laptop here and I'm over here like this. Sorry guys, we'll be a second. I'm sitting on my laptop, how about now? Is it good now, is it good now? How about now? Now, you guys see it? You guys see it now? It's like, that's terrible, terrible experience. So when we did our conference, we said, we're gonna do something like it's never been done before in the industry. And we had smoke and we had fog and we had contortionists. We had people doing flips. We had 12 foot robots. We had big drummers. We had jugglers. We had, I had fire breathers, which we lost our deposit on because we found out the CEO of the venue has a legit fear of fire, like a phobia. So we lost like 600 bucks on the fire breather deposit. But we had like all this stuff. And Kelsey, uh, my EA right here, she also did not let me get the tigers that I wanted either. Yeah, well, but I was ready to go all out. And we had some of the best speakers there ever. And people were walking out like it was the best conference. We already sold more tickets to next year's conference than we, than we sold in the first six months of the last one. Because it's just ready, people are ready for it. But that's different, you cannot duplicate. I can go to the Marriott and duplicate what I've been seeing. You cannot easily duplicate what we did. Too much work, maybe even too much money, too much creativity, and too many resources that you'll need. And then we did another thing. So. Uh, another person through the podcast, The Goat Show, that I've got, I've been able to interview some really great people. And one of the guys I got to interview, I've become friends with, his name's Grant Cardone. I'm sure you guys know Grant Cardone, right? Guy's like all over the place. So he gave me an idea, because I was talking about writing a book, and he's like, dude, you don't need to write a book, man. He's like, you don't need to write a book, man. I was like, no, he's like, I mean, you need to write a book, man. But you don't need to write a book right now, man. And I was like, what do I need to do? He's like, dude, he whipped out his millionaire booklet. I mean, you guys see the millionaire booklet. He's like, dude, took me a day to write, man takes you an hour to read, man, it's quick, it's quick, they like that. And I was like, all right, cool. And then a week later, I had this book, Fitness Marketing Secrets. And it took me a day to write, and it takes an hour to read. And the cool thing about this is, we were sponsoring at a lot of events, uh, fitness, obviously, conferences, that kind of deal. And we always wanted to know what to put in the swag bag. Oh, branded, you know, uh, mouse pads. Oh, branded sanitizer. Oh, branded iPod charger or Apple chargers or all these different things. Like, who cares? Who cares? This, on the other hand, was definitely more impactful. Fitness marketing secrets, you go in there. There's a bunch of really helpful stuff in there. It teaches you literally how we're doing a lot of what we're doing for studios. But there's call to actions in there. There's URLs that go to pages that have retargeting on it. There's a bunch of stuff that guides people through so they can learn more about what we do and how I do it. In fact, it works so well that I took one more day and wrote Fitness Selling Secrets. <laughs> they got my face on it, easy to brand. Does anybody want one? Yeah, so you can see? Yeah, okay. Well, are you guys all together, I'm assuming? No, okay, sorry. There we go. It was just easier, I don't wanna hurt anyone, paper cuts. So if you guys want them, like you've all seen before, go to Fitness Marketing Secrets or fitnesssellingsecrets.com and just get it for free. Pull shipping. So we wrote those books and it's been fantastic. We actually had one guy sign on a ridiculous amount of locations with us. When I say ridiculous, so far we're working with 120. It's 120 clients because of an hour. So that times like 1,500 bucks, I don't know, $180,000 a month, you're talking a two, three million dollar contract per year, right? for a booklet, and that's just one franchise. So really think about the content you're creating because that is actually easier to duplicate, but people don't, won't even give it a shot. They'll just, it's easier to just put up a video like this, right? So we started doing that. <laughs> All right, the next thing we, we really did that I think was re really important is the team that we really started to build. Um, I, I believe in making sure that you actually have people on your team that are better than you at what you do. And then I don't just believe in it, but I hire for that. 
And so my VP of operations is way better than me at operations. Whenever I bring, come to him with an idea, the first thing he says is, okay, well, how are we gonna create a process for that? His, that's where his brain goes. How do we create a process so we don't drop any balls and it's executed the right way and everything works and we can measure it and we can do all that. And that's how he is for everything. Everything in our company is 100% tracked and processed and systemized and documented. In fact, when people come to work for our company, that's the first thing they compliment is you guys just have processes for everything. It's unbelievable how much people are able to get done. In fact, our account managers, when we first started, were only able to handle 15 accounts per account manager. We have people handling 60 accounts with better customer service reports. Better because of the systems and processes that we've got. Is that pretty cool? Yep. So they're making more money, we're making more money, and the clients are getting better service, which is fantastic. But in order to do that, you have to make sure that you're really looking at things and, and asking them things in the interview process. How many of you guys use personality assessments, like really use them, disc assessments? Because I used to use them, meaning I would make people take them, but then I would like hire people anyway, even if it didn't fit. I'm like, oh, I see something in them anyway. Because the thing is, entrepreneurs, we're just so positive and optimistic that we can make anything happen. We think we can literally change this person's wiring. We're like, oh, he's got potential, we'll figure it out. And then it doesn't happen. So we look for people that are uncomfortable uncomfortable not double checking, tripping their, trip, uh, triple checking their work. We look for people that are uncomfortable not having a system or following a process because we want them to follow the processes so well. So if you guys aren't using that, I definitely recommend you guys use DISC or 16 Personalities or Myers-Briggs or one of those as well for your hiring because it works. And when you have certain things in place, people will leave very quickly. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. Another thing that I do with building my team is attitude. So we won best place to work a couple years ago, which is great. Um, but along the way, we've always been ranked. And the funny thing is, even though we didn't win it this year, we got a 10 times better culture than we did the year we won it. I don't know how those things are rated. I don't know. But we're way better now than we were then. And a lot of the things are around making sure your people are constantly moving up. We have 30 some employees now, 40, 40 employees. All of them are reading at lunch. They're all reading, whether it's lunch, whether it's after work, before work, they're all hitting goals. McKenna here, lost 40 pounds in the last like six months, going to F45. Kelsey here is literally connected with Russell Brunson's assistant, um, Cameron Harold's assistant, Billy Jean's assistant, Train Jules' assistant, Diane Pickle's assistant. And so now she's basically getting with all of them and creating a mastermind so she can learn how to be a better EA. Is that pretty cool? Like she could just reaches out and connects masterminds. Yeah, yeah, we'll give that, that's pretty cool. So the idea is, how can you get your employees to be the best version of whatever they're hired to do? How many of you guys would like it if your EA was literally studying the best EAs in the world to find out how she can be the best EA for you? How many of you guys would like that? How many of you guys would like it if your video producer was studying the best videos in the world to find out how to create the best video for you? How many of you guys would like that? Okay, guess what they would like? They would like you to study how to be the absolute best CEO so you can be the best CEO for them. And that doesn't mean the best marketer. That doesn't mean the best salesperson. That doesn't mean the best anything other than CEO. And now sometimes it does mean you have to put your marketing hat on. And sometimes you have to put on your sales hat, but you have to get people to wear those hats more often other than you. Does that make sense? Yes? My VP of sales today is a guy that was my sales manager 13 years ago. One of the sales reps that we have working for us was the first guy that hired me in sales at LA Fitness 15 years ago, right? So now when you're looking for people like that, the problem is you don't know where to find them. How many of you guys feel like it's hard to find good people sometimes or great people? Yeah. How many of you guys, how many of you guys have heard the phrase, man, if you have to choose hiring character over skill, hire character every time. Raise your hands if you believe that. Yeah, you're right. Character over skill. However, there's a third option. What's the third option? Both. Here's the problem though. If you feel like, how many of you guys feel like both are unicorns? Yeah, they're not. They're just not applying. They're not looking for work. They're not filling out your Indeed applic applications. They're not on jobbing. They're not responding to your Facebook ad. They're not doing any of that. Why do you think they're not doing any of that? They got a good job. They're getting paid well and they've got a good future with security. Right? So how do you think you get them? Yeah, you got to take them. You gotta go take them, go get them. I've been recruited before. LeBron James has been recruited. Everyone in any sport has been recruited, right? The idea is, yeah, I get it. You're on a team that just won a championship at the Cavs and you've been to the finals four years in a row with the Cavs, but I gotta tell you why it's gonna be better in LA. Here's why. And that's your job, right? Didn't Steve Jobs do that with the, the Coca-Cola or Pepsi guy? Coca-Cola or Pepsi, Pepsi? Pepsi, he took the Pepsi 
CMO to come and be his CMO instead, right? And so you just gotta be, that's where you put on your sales hat. I haven't made an end user sale. We've had now over 2000 clients. I haven't made an end user sale in like two and a half years. All my sales now are employee base. Always have a dream list. I got 15 people right now on my list that I want to work for me. Maybe not today, maybe not in six months, but I want you someday and you're gonna work for me at one point or another. So Dan, my VP of sales, I've been courting him for a year. Just following up, hey man, how are things going? Oh yeah, he's gonna ask you how things going. Dude, we're growing really fast, man. We're building a really great team, it's awesome. And that's it, and little by little, you find the time, you connect, and then you make that moment. Matt Cafora, that was like a six month thing in working. Billy was like Billy Sykes, not Billy Jean. Billy Sykes, that was like a two year thing in working. Right, so the guys that are great, you've gotta court them for a little while. You might be friend zoned for a little while, but you gotta wait it out, and you gotta get it at the right time, and always make that compelling argument as to why you're better. So look for those people because character and skill is always going to win. Now, when you get them in house, you got to make sure that you decide who they're going to be. How many of you guys believe you are a product of the environment you surround yourself with in every sense of the word, right? You are just like you, body wise, you are what you eat and do with it, right? Like my, my fingers and the skin on it and the hair and all this stuff. This is because I ate something that converted into this, right? So I probably should have eaten something better, but I ate something that converted to this, right? And all you guys ate stuff and did stuff that converted you to you. And what you put in your body, and what you do with it is what you get. And what you put in your mind and what you do with it is what you get up here. And so music, TV, people, all that stuff. Well, guess who you probably spend a lot of time with throughout the day? Who? Your team. Your team. Everyone say it loud. Team. Your team, right? That was everybody? Dude, come on, give me something. Who? Your team, team, ready? One, two, three. Team. There you go. You spend a lot of time with your team. When you spend a lot of time with your team, who could you start becoming more like? The team, the team without even knowing it, right? And so for me, I want to make sure that my team is as hungry, as motivated, and speaks with as much certainty as I want to. So there's words that we're not allowed to say in my company. In fact, there's words you're not even allowed to say in my house. Try is one of them. I even feel ugly saying it. I don't even want to say the word. Mm. Pay attention to how many people say the word. But try will kill you in your life. It'll kill you in sales as well. And I'll actually prove it to you by taking you outside of the industry and putting you in a different situation where a sale needs to be made. Imagine you're the coach of a team, a basketball team, and you worked all season long to make it to the championship game. All season long, and here you are. You finally made it. Champ championship game, go game's going great. The other team just scores with two seconds left, and they took the lead by one. So now you're down by one. How much are you down by? One. You're down by one. You call a timeout. You say, all right, guys, come on in. You look at your two guys that have been reliable for you all season long. You got one guy, his name's Tony. What's his name? Tony. Say it again. What's his name? Tony. You got the other guy, his name's Mike. What's his name? Mike. You go, Tony. Tony, man, what do we do? Mike, what do we do? And Tony goes, coach, give me the ball. I'm going to try to make this shot. And Mike goes, coach, give me the ball. I will make this shot. Who's coach giving the ball to? Who, wait, hold on. Count of three. Say Tony or Mike. One, two, three. Everyone said Mike, and no one thought about it. But they've been the same all season. They've been reliable all season. You're telling me at, you just made your entire decision off of one word? Off of one word? Yes. Subconsciously, you did. Now, the coach doesn't know. You know because you were listening for the word, but the coach doesn't know why. They're just hearing it. A lot of the decisions aren't made on the, on the rational level. They're made in the gut. That's why sometimes you look at things and it doesn't make any sense at all, but it feels right, so you do it anyway. Vice versa. Sometimes it doesn't it, like, like everyone's telling you not to do it, not to do it, not to do it, and you do it anyway because it feels right. Does that make sense? Like, it goes back both ways. So in this case, you gotta understand that your clients and your team may, be not, they may not be responding to you the way you think because of words that you're using that are actually getting them to create a lack of certainty in you. So we don't say it at all. So I'm trying to think. No, you're not, you're thinking. Oh, I'm trying to eat. No, you're not, you're eating. I'm trying to write. No, you're writing, right? <clears throat> you don't even say it. Now, sometimes you could say it's applicable. Yeah, I tried that. Yep, yeah, okay, you could also say I gave it a shot, right? The goal, the goal is to take it out so you can have control over the words that you're saying, you can practice it. Once you get to that point, where you're hearing it. Like if anyone said it, it's like a curse word. Like you hear the F word, I hear that. And so I can hear it and it, and it bothers me. Once you get to that point, then you can reinsert it back in and you could do it on the opposing end. So if I'm meeting with you and we're talking about your experience with the last agency. So what's your name? Isla. Isla, so when you worked with ABC agency, what kind of stuff did they try to do with you? Oh, okay, awesome. And so when they tried that, how'd it go? Got it, so you just kept trying to work it out with them and just didn't really work well? 
Got it. Well, here's what we do here. Here's how it works. Here's what you will expect from us, and here's what we expect from you. And the funny thing is, on a subconscious level, they can't rationalize it. All they feel when they leave the meeting is, dude, these guys are night and day from the other company. That's it. Because I put all the weaknesses and uncertainty on them, right? It's anchor. I, I put it on them. And then I, I let me take all the strength and the, and the security and the commitment and all that stuff, right? So when they leave, they've got that. Your employees too. Hey, can you try to get that done by tomorrow? Hey, I need you to get that done by tomorrow, right? Two different things. People say that word for two reasons. One, because everyone around them does it. And so now it's just trained, right? If you say dude all the time, everyone says dude around me all the time, I'm gonna start saying dude. But also because it takes away the commitment. I don't have to commit to the result, I just have to commit to the attempt. As long as I attempted, I kept my word. Does that make sense? But we don't wanna do that. Speak with clarity, speak with certainty to your team. No black and white. I spoke to somebody earlier today and it was crazy. It was like a machine gun assault rifle. They were like, every weak word in the world was put in one sentence. Yeah, so pretty much I try to kind of like, I'm like, poof, poof, poof. pretty much I kind of try to like, and it's like, dude, every word, just say, this is what I do. I do this. This is how I work. I do that. Does that make sense to you guys? Yep. Okay. So make sure that you guys are doing that as well. <laughs> and then make sure that you guys are constantly focused on exactly how your sales process is going to roll. Sales, I think, is, is something that a lot of agencies don't do well, including my past self, because we expect the marketing to do the work. And uh, I've even heard people on stage say it, where they're like, if your marketing's good, you don't need to be that good at sales. The marketing will sell it for you. They call it schmarketing or something. And, and you know, maybe it's true. I don't know. I personally haven't experienced that to be true. I believe you do have to sell well, and you do have to have a sales force and a follow-up process and stuff that takes people over the edge, because we all need it too. The problem is marketers don't want to hear that because in truth, a lot of marketers don't like to sell. Neither do your clients sometimes. How many of you guys wish your clients put more effort into the sales process, right? Well, at that, then we got to do the same thing. So for us, we have a sales process. Now, one thing that I did wrong, we've lost salespeople before. It didn't work, work out. We hired them, didn't work out, and they left. I wanted to figure out why. The reason why is because I was doing the right thing, but I was doing it wrong. What I was doing wrong was I was hiring the salespeople and I didn't have the time to be able to actually train them the right way. See, sales are the salespeople are the easiest people to measure, but the most difficult to manage or train. Yep. And so when you get them on board, who's actually training them regularly? Who's role playing with them regularly? Because they'll go off script. Who's actually monitoring their calls? Who's coming in to help out with the close? Who's coming in to help out with value? Not me. I couldn't do it. Not especially with multiple salespeople. So what we did instead, I took the advice of, of a person who's been kind of like a mentor to me, and instead, I hired a VP of sales and then let him build his sales team. And now he's role playing with them every day. He's sales training with them every day. Salespeople should not cost you money, ever. If a, if a salesperson is demanding seven grand or eight grand a month, and you look at their track record and they did really, really good where they were, pay it. You'll get it back next month. You, you will get it back next month. That is an easy win. And if you don't, how easy is it to measure that they did it or not? That's it. You, you cut it, right? It's very, very easy to measure them. It's not like a graphic designer where you're like, I get it, it's different. I, no, it's, this is easy. Like, did you, how many calls did you make? Right, we use, we use uh, what do we use now, CallRail? We use CallRail. Uh, I'm sorry, Ring Central. Ring Central we use. So how many calls did you make? What's your talk time? How many, how many uh, demos did you book? How many demos did you do? How many showed up? How many of those did you close? How many agreements did you get out? Right, what's your, what's your length of time? What's your sales pipeline look like? How, how long on average are they waiting? What's your average dollar per sale? Right, these are easy. These are easy things to measure. How many of you guys feel like you can pull those numbers very, very easily? Yeah, they're very, very easy to pull. So when you get that and you put it up there, very simple. Another thing, make sure you guys have scoreboards and scorecards up in your office. How many of you guys have scoreboards or scorecards up in your office where every employee can see how every employee is doing? Nope. So we have this thing up, it's our scoreboard. And we can see every department and within most departments how every employee is contributing to the growth of this company. Now, when I first rolled it out, do you think people liked it or didn't like it? Didn't like it. Why do you think they didn't like it? They didn't want, yeah, they didn't want to be accountable for their shortcomings. But what does Kobe Bryant and Tiger Woods want? They want everything analyzed, every part of that. So I'm a terrible golfer, so I'm already off probably. But they want every, every inch. Tiger Woods wants every inch of that swing analyzed, right? Kobe Bryant wants every part of his game analyzed, and he wants to analyze others. He wants to be measured because he wants to be what? Great. 
Tom Brady, everybody. Beyonce, let me hear it. I want to hear it. No, you see how they particular they are, right? So we've got to get that into our employees' minds because a lot of times we're taught the wrong thing or the right thing in the wrong way, which is, oh, you shouldn't have to micromanage people. It's not micromanaging. I'm not going to like tell you in the middle of you doing it how to do it. I'm measuring and analyzing your performance because with the results and the data that I get from that, we're able to make adjustments to get better results. How many of you guys wish you had a really great CEO, like a Richard Branson, like analyzing your entire day and then giving you data based on that and what you could have done better that day? How many of you guys would like that? Right? Would you consider that micromanaging or would you consider like the most amazing thing you could have added to your business right now? Dude, I would love that. I would love that if I had somebody like that watching me all day and then at the end being like, all right, man, here's what you could have done a lot better. Here's where you dropped the ball. When you said this to the employee, here's what you could have done. But we've got to get our, our team to really understand that's why we're doing it, not to micromanage you. And so we put the boards up. Yeah, for the first month they hated it. Now, everyone goes up, they talk about it, you see them looking at the screen, they're into it. And now, results start climbing over and over and over and over again. Another thing that worked really well for us is partnerships, affiliates building relationships with people that are actually targeting the same audience that you're targeting, in our case, fitness studios. So who else is going after it? CRMs, uh, automated marketing, uh, text marketing tools, um, software, any other type of software, supplements, whatever. We've got right now, I think, 40 or 50 different partners, and we hired a partner manager just to do this. His entire job is to reach out to people that are targeting the same audience as us. Oh, you design websites for fitness studios? Perfect, we want you. And we would find a way to collaborate with them on content, whether it's webinars, whether it's blogs, whether it's videos, whether it's events, whether it's just a list, an email list, or whether it's actually just referring business for an affiliate commission kickback. That has worked really well for us. How many of you guys are doing stuff like that already? Yep. So if you can, hire a person just to do that all day. And if you can't hire somebody that's actually done it before, because that's really good. So somebody has like some sort of a partner marketing, affiliate marketing, something like that in their background. So look for that on LinkedIn. That, by the way, that's where you find people too. If you're looking where to find those people that have character and skill, go to LinkedIn, type in companies that you know have a great culture. You can look at the best places to work lists. Start with that. Look for people that have a great culture. Then from there, go down all their employees and look for people that have worked there for two years or longer and people that have had maybe some promotions along the way. Those are the people that you target. Yes? Good? You just reach out to them there. By the way, when you pitch them, you gotta make sure how you pitch it. Don't say, hey, are you open to hearing other opportunities? Don't say that, because that creates a disloyal factor. What you do is you say, are you closed off to other opportunities if there's some really good ones out there for you? People don't wanna be closed off. They wanna be loyal, but they don't wanna be closed off. So I kinda of switched the verbiage a little bit. So that's really good as well. But also like anywhere you go, like Kelsey see me like pitch the waitress before. Like everybody, everybody out there has got great personality can contribute to your business. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. So the next thing I want you to guys focus on is your actual money. This is something I don't think a lot of uh, CEOs are really doing really well in the agency world, is really understanding your money and where it's going. So how many of you guys really know your net profit every single month? Like your actual net profit. Okay, great. How many of you guys understand exactly what you need to be putting into your business every single month, whether it goes for marketing or salary cap? Like how many of you guys have a salary cap? Yeah, what's your salary cap right now? 100,000, that's a pretty even number. Okay, so $100,000. So if it's $100,000, that means you can't go over $100,000, right? But what happens if you do go over 100,000? What's the only reason you could? Yeah, well, what's the, is there a, re, is there a reason why you ever would go over 100,000? Well, that's a why it happened, but why would you ever plan to? Would you ever, do you guys think there's a reason to ever go over salary cap, yes or no? Yes, when would you do it, sir? Yes, well, well, you wanna go over when you know that this person's, it's a revenue generating employee, or it's a revenue generating department, or a revenue generating team. So right now we are over salary cap, but we just hired two salespeople, and we hired a video person and an ads manager that's basically all just working together to drive more business in that one team alone. Does that make sense? We are now over salary cap by like 8%, but it doesn't matter. Like, we'll, we're gonna get that right back very, very, very quickly. Does that make sense? Yes? Ultimately, guys, when you're running this business that you guys are running, first off, you're very blessed because this is a great, great time to be in the agency world. It's awesome. You guys got great resources with this, everything digital marketers doing, all the different things that are out there. Um, but understand that the things that really are going to define you and make you feel better is not like seven figures or any of that. In fact, uh, 
one of the things, Billy, Billy, Billy Jean just spent oh, like four days with Tony Robbins at his, like, in Fiji or whatever, and he called me from Fiji and he said, Tony Robbins just said the most crazy thing ever. And I go, what? He's like, this one guy was like talking about being a seven-figure agency and Tony Robbins goes, how long is a million seconds? Does anybody know how long a million seconds is? Yeah. Oh, not you, because you, you're, you're, you're work with me. Anybody? It's 11 days. 11 days. Now, how long do you think a billion seconds is? What would you guess? A year? 32 years. That's the difference between a million and a billion. 11 days and 32 years. And he goes, we're not playing with seven figures. And the idea, what he was wanting to explain is, it's not about being seven figures. It's not about doing a million dollars. That, that's, everyone's doing that now. What it's about is building a company where everyone you touch is growing significantly. Your members, your clients, your employees, everyone, when they leave you, regardless of how they know you, is actually better, more valuable because of you. And you're leaving your mark. As of right now, Loud Rumors donate over $100,000 to charity and over, I don't know, 1,000 hours of charity. And we're doing another 10,000 at the end of this year. And we do it with, as a team. We all go do stuff and we go feed and we contribute and we do all that. And how many of you guys think your team would really like seeing that stuff and being a part of that and telling their mom and dad that's what their company they're working for is doing? And it feels really good to be able to do that. So guys, the big takeaway I, I want for you guys to have today is just understand it's not about being a great marketer. You're no longer a marketer. You are the CEO of a company that may offer marketing services or advertising services. And just like anything else, whether you're a restaurant or whether you're a gym or anything else, your job now is to master what it means to actually be a great CEO and not necessarily a marketer. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes? How many of you guys learned some stuff today that you think you could take home with you? Yep. How many of you guys liked today's talk? Yes? Thank you all very much for being here.